Well, welcome everyone to CG webinar seminar number 333, which constitutes half of a great beast, if you believe in all that mythology. 333, nice number. Uh, we have with us Malika and Hannah. Uh, I'll introduce them in a moment. They're going to talk about legislating history, rebuilding the nation, no freedom for academics, and they're going to touch on a lot of contemporary issues and problems in this presentation. Now, today's webinar, Malika Popovic. Uh, is a project lead and postdoctoral fellow at the Global Observatory on Academic Freedom at the Central European University in Vienna. And she has lots of experience in international organizations and as a researcher and consultant on higher education issues. She's currently preparing a monograph based on a thesis research on you go on nostalgia and memory narratives of the generation of the last pioneers. Um, Hannah Jones is a uh, professor of sociology at Warwick, and she writes on res uh, and researches and teaches on belonging, racism, and migration control, political emotions, and critical public sociology. The latest book is Violent Ignorance Confronting Racism and Migration Control, Bloomsbury, our Center for Global Higher Education publisher. Pleased to mention Bloomsbury's name. So, without further ado, I think I'll hand it over to our presenters, and I think Malika, you will start. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Let me just start, of course, with sharing my screen. We can see that. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much uh, for giving us an opportunity uh, to present uh, our new project that Hannah and me have been working on uh, for the last couple of months and really trying to understand what academic freedom means for specific disciplines and how these contemporary infringements on academic freedom that we have seen going global have various ways and various appearances. And of course, we know that in today's uh, world, we have seen so many different ways to infringe on academic freedom. We have, of course, the state overregulation in the very name of academic freedom, which Hannah will be speaking a, a bit more later on when she will be discussing the case of United Kingdom. But we have also seen infringements through state led overregulation in the name of quality of higher education. Uh, then, of course, the mostly important aspect, which is sometimes forgotten, and that is the precarization of scholars, uh, the lower funding to science and research, which has been given recently, um, and the, the, the phenomena that surrounds actually the issue of precarity of especially early career researchers. Um, and then last, but definitely not the least, are the value-based discourses, the ones that the regimes actually use in order to continue their nation building, the state building narratives, using the ideas of so-called national Republican European values. And of course, in all of that diversity, it is not only the state that infringes upon academic freedom, it is sometimes also the non-governmental organizations, different political movements, sometimes also in coalition with the state. And then of course, there are certain elements where we can see endangerment of academic freedom within the academic community itself. And why did we understand that this kind of overabundance of memory legislation, which has been appearing in the last decades, has shown to have such a significant impact on academic freedom as such? And of course, when we think about memory legislation or so-called history legislation, what would it actually mean? It would mean state-approved interpretations of historical event events and promotion of specific narratives about the past. As we might know here, we enter indeed a slippery terrain because of course, some of these uh, legislations do have a well-established arguments for being actually put in place. But at the same time, there has been a movement of mushrooming such legislation, such regulations, and kind of importance of discussing the past in the political arena has been raising in the last years. And just as one of the examples, we can see here the words of Emmanuel Macron, the French president, who while commenting actually the events um, of Black Lives Matter movement says that, of course, there might be some forgotten heroes, but there is no history to be revised. 
we should not actually mix different struggles and we should not look at our history through the eyes of today and the present. And what is specifically interesting to see is that following this movement where memory legislation was really gaining ground, not only in terms of national legislation where we could have seen many uh, specific examples, which I will be talking about more in details just in a minute, but also at the European level, we could have seen European Parliament passing through numerous resolutions, like uh, the most uh, famous one, maybe the one from 2008, uh, followed with a declaration also later on, uh, uh, 2008 and 2006, um, which has been putting together Stalinism or communism with Nazism. Or we can see actually the rising number of European funded NGOs, the Observatory on Memories, the Observatory in History Teaching in Europe that has been founded by the Council of Europe, and also some frictions on the level between national legislation and international judiciary. There has been a lot of judiciary cases that have been prosecuted by the European Court of Human Rights trying to actually untangle these questions of, is it possible to legislate, legislate history? And in parallel to that, in the last couple of years, we could have seen a rise in academic freedom legislation. And if we just continue looking at the European higher education area, we all know so well, especially here within this forum, how much academic freedom has been gaining the traction and the importance there has already been this underlining in the Rome communique and then 2020 uh, in Paris communique in 2019 and then with the 2020 Rome statement on academic freedom we have gotten for the first time an accepted definition of academic freedom within the European higher education area to mention only a few and when we look and think about possibilities of what kind of regimes would actually be ready to infringe upon academic freedom in order to build their nation, building identities and policies, we always have the usual suspects. We know that in 2018, China did adopt a law that prohibited misrepresentation, defamation, and attempts to deny the deeds and spirits of heroes and martyrs, or to praise or beautify invasions. And of course, that this has been followed in practice. We know that in 2021, there was a Tiananmen uh, massacre monument that has been removed from the University of Hong Kong, which caused uh, quite a bit of discussion and attempt from the students of the University of Hong Kong to actually stop the demolishment, but this uh, has not succeeded. Um, even before the invasion of Ukraine, we know that within the Russian Federation, the issue of legislating history has been pretty much in the forefront. And we know that, for example, the NGO Memorial, who has been hardly working on keeping the memory on the victims of Stalinism, has been put on the foreign agents list. And then Together with all these illiberal usual suspects, we had United States of America joining them more and more prominently. And we have witnessed in a number of American states like Idaho, Florida, Texas, mostly being focused on banning the teaching of critical race theory, not only at the level of K-12 schools, but then also um, further going into the higher education. One of these examples at the level of Europe and European Union has been in the case of Poland. There has been a civil case brought against Professor Barbara Engelkind and Professor Jan Grabowski for a book in which they had written about the complicity of Catholic Poles in the Holocaust during Nazi Germany's occupation. And just some years before, Poland has actually adopted a law in which it is prohibited in any way to insinuate the cooperation of Polish nation with the Nazi regime in the Holocaust. Using Pol Polish Anti-Defamation League, which is a far-right NGO, uh, one of the descendants of the people who have been mentioned in Professor Engelke's and Grabowski book has actually then raised a civil case. What has been even more worrying is that at the first instance, actually, the professors have been condemned uh, and told that they would need to change their writing and research and take out the personal 
data of the person in question. Luckily, at the level of the Court of Appeals, the ruling was overturned, and it has been clearly said that it was an acceptable violation of the freedom of scientific research and the freedom of expression. So going step beyond the so-called usual suspects and all the liberal regimes, what Hannah and me kind of wanted to look into further was also a number of worrying elements that have started to appear in the so-called liberal democracies. And most uh, prominently, we have started looking at France and the United Kingdom. Why have these two countries been chosen? And I think what is really interesting to see is that there have been a number of similarities and a number of differences between the two countries and the regimes uh, currently in, in question. So when we look at France and the UK, what has been evident is that the current governments in the last decades had so much of an entrepreneurial spirit, so to say, which has led to further neoliberalization of higher education. Those have both been societies which have been struck by terrorist acts in the last decades. And all of these kinds of developments have led to strengthening of so-called culture wars and the growing right-wing influence on the overall political space. However, of course, there have been different elements. When we have looked into specific ways on which academic freedom and the academics have been attacked within the two countries, we could have seen that the topics that were used in order to attack the academics have been slightly different. In the case of UK, it has been most prominently anti-Semitism, while in France, it has been most prominently islamo gauchism which could be actually Islamo-leftism. Um, in the UK, the infringements on academic freedom were mostly conducted in the name of freedom of speech, while in the French case, that was in the name of laicite, uh, which could be translated as secularism, I think, most closely, even though um, this could also um, be, be a more uh, matter for discussion. Um, in regards of a more general European position of the two countries in question, we have UK, which has gone through Brexit, and in France, a renewal of the European commitment by President Macron. And also, France has still managed somehow to remain some of the social democratic policies, while in the UK, we could have seen a much longer period of time of dismantling of the welfare state. And why did we say that at the end, actually, what we are observing in a certain way here in France today is what I've called macronization of higher education, is that there has been a number of legislative attempts of reforming higher education. Um, I will not go here into details. Um, and they did not necessarily look directly into the issue of academic freedom, which has been protected at the constitutional level in France, not by the constitution itself, but by the constitutional council ever since 1984. But the defunding of public research and science, the changes in the uh, recruitment procedures of academic staff, um, more and more precarizations and opening of different possibilities of short-term contracts have deeply impacted the French higher education. But at the same time, there was another un undergoing phenomenon. President Macron has actually expressed a lot of interest in history and uh, memory politics. Um, and just one of these examples has been the fact that he has commissioned a historian, Benjamin Stora, to write a report on the history of French-Algerian war and the Algerian fight for independence. And there has been a whole ceremony of the historians um, actually giving the report to President Macron as the ultimate confirmation of the dedication of government to discovering the right truth the right history that exactly happened in place. And of course, as you can imagine, there was not such a unilateral adoption of the report itself, especially on the Algerian side. But in parallel to that, already in 2020, actually President Macron has been saying that all these dissident voices from the social sciences are a reflection of the problems in French society, the divisions in French society, and it is the social scientists who are responsible for the ethnicization of the social question. And that has been followed by the, his ministers of higher education and research and minister of education. Minister Vidal has invited CNRS 
uh, Conseil National uh, de la Recherche uh, et Science, to lead an investigation into Islamo leftism in the universities, because as she was saying, they were the gangrene of universities. Of course, that CNRS as the national wide uh, research um, network of institutes um, of research in France has denied this plea, saying that they are not in a position to discipline and control the work of academics and that such a demand is seriously infringing upon academic freedom. But it did not stop and the Minister of Education has founded his own lab laboratory of the Republic uh, with the objective, as he said himself, winning the war of the ideas and particularly look into the academic field that suffers the thrust of wokeism and cancel culture. What is important to retain is also to understand that the discourses which have surrounded the debate in France around this have been largely xenophobic, racist, and really retinent to any kind of foreign influences. Even um, the idea itself, it, as it has been said, is that the cancel culture, the wokeism, um, the critical race theory, the gender theory, those are all bad influences that have come from United States and have caused the gangrene in French culture and way of life. And I will give the floor to Hannah to now go more into the UK example. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk in, in a bit more detail for the rest of the talk about how we've seen these things work in the UK. So the UK as a um, within the kind of global academic community um, and thinking about the current freedom of speech, higher education bill in context. So on this slide, we're thinking about what are the what is um, academic freedom more broadly and some of the and it's not been something that's been really talked about um, in public debate until the last few years as a kind of um, central question of public um, importance. However, the universities and college union has produced some work on in the last few years around what is academic freedom in the UK, fairly low understandings of what that might mean among the academic community itself. Um, but points also to the kind of broader questions, which we tend not to talk about as um, questions of academic freedom in the first instance. So some of the things that are broader um, global questions in many regions, which Melitza mentioned, so marketization of higher education, specifically in the UK, the introduction of tuition fees, first for international students, then for UK students, and then continuing to increase, which means it changes the um, orientation of students um, to the university, particularly around student debt and particularly around numbers and the way that calculation of what is worth tends to happen in universities. In terms of what this might do for the ability to achieve what we do and what we think we're doing, um, this marketization is also translated to some of the things which are at the centre of a national industrial dispute in the UK at the moment in universities around the massive increase in short-term contracts with around a third of research workers in universities being on short-term contracts and precarious contracts, increasing in workload, real-term pay cuts over the last 10 years um, for something that was a profession um, that was a kind of um, expected to be well-paid. Um, in terms of the objectives of what UK academia is then, it's been marketized, it's focused on Income, and also the increase in league tables, the importance of not just the REF, but also things like the teaching excellence framework. Um, so the REF being the research excellence framework, which monitors um, research outputs by universities, um, re-looking at peer reviewed work, deciding its worth, deciding whether it's nationally, internationally, or globally significant, the amount of work that's put into that in order to redistribute funding and prestige. Other things like um, less regulation of student numbers, which has in fact caused um, increased bureaucracy and problems for uneven spread of students across different institutions. Measurements of um, the ability, of the excellence of universities based on what their graduates earn. Um, reductions in particular support for creative subjects, which might cost more to teach, which all have impacts on what the university thinks it's doing. Similarly, changes in philanthropic donations, so more um, dependence on um, 
specific donors than maybe in the more recent decades and reduction in the democratic governance of universities all mean that UK academia has moved to being talked about within universities as a business in many places and needing to self-sustain. I'm oh, sorry, I'm going to stay on that slide for a second. Um, so in terms of the ability to pursue what knowledge is, questions around who's working where, um, the kind of work that academics are doing is taken over in terms of more regulatory frameworks, more kinds of questions about personal freedom in different contexts, more um, uneven monitoring of academics from overseas in the context of wider changes to immigration control and questions around online teaching, all of which produce different kinds of work which may be affecting academic freedom in the sense of the workload, the ability to, to push new ideas around teaching and research when occupied with these kind of questions. Next slide. So what are the existing protections? We're having, um, since for the last two years, there's been a bill going through parliament, which has nearly completed its um, journey through parliament into law around protecting freedom of speech in universities. But there are existing protections in the UK law that isn't the kind of constitutional protection that some European countries have within the national constitution for universities as places of academic freedom. But there has been since 1986 a duty to secure freedom of speech in universities, um, followed by the Education Reform Act, which establishes academic freedom in UK law. And in that law, it's defined as freedom within law to question and test receive wisdom, put forward new ideas and controversial or unpopular opinions without placing, without academics placing themselves in jeopardy of losing jobs or privileges at their institutions. So the, the, it's very similar to the European definition that Melissa was talking about, but has less detail in terms of things like um, methodologies and a gathering of data. It's very much a similar definition to definitions of freedom of speech, but with a particular focus on academics protections within their jobs. Um, the Higher Education Research Act in 2017 does give a bit more detail, um, different detail to the European definition, but emphasizes that institutions should have the freedom to talk about particular content of courses, um, criteria for selecting academic staff, and criteria for students' admission. Those things are at the institutional level rather than at the individual academic level. Um, and they're also in the context of that marketized prioritization I was talking about before. So the institution can choose which courses to teach, but also has to find a way of um, funding unpopular courses, for example. But these are still protections there in law for academic freedom. Academics should not be punished just for the work that they do in that academic research and teaching. The next slide, please. All of that is within the law. So both freedom of speech and academic freedom in the UK are always stated as within the law. Um, and what's unlawful speech in the UK outside the law is just kind of summarized on this slide, which is taken from, um, summarized, I'm using uh, guidance that the Joint Commission on Human Rights from the Parliamentary Committee produced, talking particularly about freedom of speech in universities. So some things on there are fairly standard. All of these are quite long standing limitations on um, free speech in the, specific to the UK. So threat to kill, fair enough, probably don't want that in universities. And um, there are some here though, that are maybe more um, contentious, like most rights-based conversations need to be considered um, in terms of conflicting rights, but also in terms of questions about the questions of memory, nationalism and values that we're particularly interested, that Melissa are particularly interested in. Um, so incitement to or encouraging of terrorism, including any form of praise or celebration of the pre preparation of terrorism in the past, future or in general, is unlawful speech since 2000 and 2006 is the um, so glorification of terrorism isn't, isn't something we're arguing for here. But what constitutes terrorism does change over time. So what would that mean in terms of celebrating um, Nelson Mandela's role in the anti-apartheid movement. That could be um, read as um, praise or celebration of something which at the time was was a was violent act, which was against the law. So some of these things are not as straightforward. We don't know of any cases of that happening in terms of those historical events, but each of these are um, 
stating that law, lawful speech must be within the law does not necessarily get us out of that question of how to understand what's academic freedom and what the limitations on it might be. Um, kind of the next slide. The other part of this is not just in terms of rights and questions of academic freedom, lawful versus unlawful speech, but that universities also have other duties on them in the UK. So within the um, protection for academic freedom, the same governments have also brought in these questions around what it's possible to um, say and do within specifically within universities. So the um, public sector equality duty applies to all public bodies in the UK. Um, which creates um, a duty to, with, to have regard to the need to advance equality of opportunity, particularly around protected characteristics. So that's gender, race, religion, disability, um, a few others. Um, and those protected characteristics are um, mean that people have different kinds of needs. That raises questions and it continues to be one of the um, flash points around questions of academic freedom, or rather freedom of speech in universities, one of the two main flashpoints in the UK at the moment is around trans rights. What, is, um, what steps universities should take to protect and encourage um, people from that minoritized group to be able to take part in public life while also allowing um, the freedom of speech of people who want to question um, trans lives. Similarly, and in the last, um, up, to the, up to around, seven or eight years ago, one of the biggest questions around some of the debates around freedom of speech and academic freedom in universities in the UK was around counter-terrorism efforts. So while the current government is very keen on um, being worried about the cancellation of event, literal cancellation of events and visiting speakers in university um, with controversial views, it's also specifically already in government guidance that some events must be cancelled. And those events are um, specifically in universities, in higher education institutions, where views might um, constitute extremist views, including nonviolent extremism. Um, so if you have a speaker, you have to fill in the, the quite a detailed form in universities I've been involved in, uh, explaining who you're inviting to speak, what language they'll speak in, whether they've been controversial in the past. And the explicit guidance from the government is that the event should not be allowed to proceed if they may be encouraging extremism. The only alternative is to be able to have someone with opposing views in the same event, not at a different event, but in the same event, and that the security risks can be handled. Um, so at the same time as protest being encouraged as a fundamental um, right of freedom of speech, there are also questions around whether protest might limit other people speaking. So these kind of contradictory duties continue to be questioned in the UK context. So as I said, the, some of these protections are already there. The current Freedom of Speech Higher Education Bill is now come back from the Lords to the Commons, um, but the, the clauses at the top there have all been, are all referring to things which already existed within UK law. Freedom of speech within the law is basically the same. The Lords slightly tweaked from beliefs to opinions um, and academic freedom is basically the same. It only covers, and this is something that is worth noticing, um, only covers people, academics who are currently employed. And given the current state of precarious work in UK universities in which many academics are in between jobs or not employed for 12 month continuous contracts, there is a particular risk there which hasn't been tested yet. But the new things that are introduced are particular duties for freedom of speech on student unions, a particular director of freedom of speech and academic freedom nationally who will monitor this. Um, and also this possibility that individuals, so that would be anyone employed by the university students, but also any visiting speaker or someone who has at some time been invited to be a visiting speaker, to be able to sue the university if they feel their freedom of speech was breached. The Lords actually took that out, but the government really wants that. That's really the a key part of what this bill was for so it may be reinstated um both of those things are really about some of the focus of this is on what the name of the bill is freedom of speech rather than academic freedom so though academic freedom is mentioned within many of the political debates um, much of the freedom of speech question is around um 
visiting speakers and students being able to say what they want rather than academic research and how that can be developed. It would be interesting to talk about that in the, in the discussion. Could we have the next slide? Okay. okay. So just as we're thinking about, okay, that's the law, that's the kind of situation we're in, but what about this question of national memory, national stories, and where does that come in? Well, what's interesting is that we've been talking, I mentioned, and Melita's mentioned these structural questions which are affecting how academics are able to pursue um, their interests and their theory and development. Um, what's actually become the visible um, hot topic of academic freedom in the UK is often focused on national memory, national history, and what gets called um, culture wars. So these are just some headlines from UK government ministers intervening in what academics are doing and in explicit ways which are explicitly described as what academics should not have to face as a result of putting forward contentious views. So um, this includes um, decolonizing nonsense. Um, that was the Robert Halfen as an education, as university's minister, who was um, concerned that people about what the teaching content of universities were doing. So saying that universities should not be teaching around questions of particularly around um, sociological kind of subjects around inequalities. Um, UK culture war heats up is a, is a reference to um, Oliver Dowden, who as the culture minister, um, blocking um, the reinstatement of one of the academics on a board of a museum. So it's somebody who was working on decolonial studies and working with the museum to apply their um, expertise was refused, an unpaid job. Kwasi Kwarteng um, went as a, before he was chancellor, very short-lived, um, also intervened to prevent um, a professor from Oxford um, being chair of Research Councils UK. Um, and this was around um, his, his views, but not around his actual academic work but it still fits into the idea of academic freedom and the promotion to other jobs. And the final one there around the National Trust is, a, is kind of maybe the more, most newsworthy one that caught on, which was that um, Oliver Dowden, again, as culture minister, specifically named a particular academic, um, Corinne Fowler, who was working with the National Trust, doing historical work on the ownership or how National Trust properties had um, in their wealth, that this was traced to colonialism um, and that this was seen as not the right kind of thing for government to be funding and specifically naming particular academics as problem figures. So interventions in research, in teaching, in appointments outside the university and in management of national funding have been intervened with directly by politicians on political grounds. Um, the next slide is probably just need to do very quickly, but um, also an example of how these kind of ideas of what is a British value, what a British history is absolutely live in the debates from people pushing around academic freedom and also intervening in who from politicians and who should be doing what. So this is a, a, some quotes from Jonathan Gullis, who's a might was a very briefly an education minister um, in Boris Johnson's late in Boris Johnson's government. Someone who had both called for in the first quote there, that's a, a letter from the Common Sense Group um, of MPs who wrote to the Telegraph at, and also to the Culture Minister for some of the things I've just mentioned, who specifically say that their mission was to ensure institutional custodians of history and heritage are tasked with safeguarding and celebrating British values and not cultural Marxist dogma or the woke agenda. That's uh, the idea of cultural Marxist trying to take over is specifically an anti-Semitic um, trope, but he's also well known for trying to, claiming to be concerned with anti-Semitism in universities, particularly around teaching around Israel and Palestine, um, including the same person who wrote, who signed up to the first quote, also asking for particular people named vice chancellor in academics to be sacked from universities for um, alleged anti-Semitism and also claiming that schools should not be allowed to teach about white privilege as it comes under the prevent duty, that idea about extremist ideology. So these kind of ideas about specifically safeguarding an idea of um, what is Britain from politicians um, who want to interfere with what academics are doing and researching is, um, is definitely rife, but at the moment, 
at a moment when the same, very often the very same people are talking about academic freedom and freedom of speech. So we'll just go to the summary of what we've been talking about, really that worldwide, the first part that Melissa was talking about is we, there are these worldwide threats to academic freedom, but often it's not just the usual suspects. In fact, we can look at what we might think of as liberal democracies. We've gone into detail here with Britain and also to some extent with France. Often threats to academic freedom are not necessarily academic freedom issues, but where they are talked about as academic freedom and freedom of speech, they're often freedom of speech issues related to very um, hot topics of identity, culture, nation and history. So the calls for defense of academic freedom and freedom of speech are not apolitical, they're drawn from particular points of view and they, this is challenging for thinking about how to defend and promote academic freedom globally. Thank you. Well, isn't all that salutary and, uh, and, and quite concerning and um, really grateful to both of you for laying out the terrain so well. Um, aren't those quotes from Jonathan Gullis awful? Gosh, there's no end to the infamy that comes out of the Tories at the moment. They will wage culture wars until the next election. It's the best thing they have going for them. So we're going to see a lot more, I think. Um, now, I've got questions to start things off. We've got Dimitri waiting as well. Um, let me ask something of Malika and something of Hannah. Um, I'm very interested in this go beyond the usual suspects point because that's lurking underneath that is the notion that things might be shifting in relation to the role of the character of the state um, and in a way which is similar all over the world as so many things are uh, in, with states now. Um, I mean, this, this, this could have two interpretations. I mean, one is that we're seeing a reworking of the relationship between the state and what you might call university life. Uh, intellectual life that's expressed institutionally through universities uh, with a, a willingness to trample on the university that wasn't there before. That could be that could be a, a shift, an important shift historically, but there could be something else too. There could be something larger about the state itself, you know, becoming more competent, asserting itself on a larger scale, um, you know, very much the reversal of what we saw in the 90s with the state weakening vis-a-vis -vis global cultural and economic change. And then this, you know, bouncing back in the 2000s, but is the state becoming a stronger beast everywhere? I mean, you think about India, you know, for example, what's happened there um, with, with the, way, the role of Modi's state. Uh, you know, are we seeing a new kind of state or, you, or are we just seeing a new kind of state in the universities and what does that mean? Yeah, if, if I... If I can ha just have uh, a very brief uh, reflection on that. I think what is particularly concerning is like, like you have just kind of pointed out, it's not only the types of infringements which are changing, it's also the subjects that are infringing upon um, academic freedom that have been changing from what we have known so far. And unusual suspects kind of try to cover in our understanding, all of these changes which have been happening. Um, concerning the states and, and the regime types, um, in my personal understanding, what I think is the most concerning is that there is a very equal rise of nationalism. And I think that that is the most problematic issue is that we cannot see actually a very neat distinction between the so-called liberal and illiberal democracies. And at the same time, while we are so fond of this kind of terminology of calling certain regimes illiberal democracies. And I think that there is also a part of the catch standing there. Second is of course the 21st century. I think that there are enormous issues around the digitalization, the transfer into the online worlds, which mm. are definitely extending control over the whole of the society and that includes higher education and research as such. And the last and definitely not the least is that this transition, which has sometimes been kind of under the radar, I think, um, if we go outside of our higher education researchers communities, and that is this continuous undermining of science and research yeah. through yeah. the lack of funding. And that's the, the, the element of the economy. Um, of academic freedom that is essential. I don't know if Hannah. Yeah, I think I think that's a very good analysis. I think one thing I might add is also the um, 
that there are similar and different um, trajectories I would observe between the way the state and the universities relate in different kinds of mm -hmm. regimes and the particularly in the UK, Australia, some stay in France and other parts of Europe, the marketization of universities has also led to kind of different kinds of, there is not just high HEIs, there are many different versions of the university. So there are universities which are degree mm. factories, there are universities which are research places, there are universities which still are very rich and can ignore some of the market uh, forces. Um, but that's made really the tool through which a lot of government control is going by changing the rules of that neoliberal, so managed market of universities, which changes what we're doing mm. in them. If um, government's becoming a bigger player in many places with vis-a-vis -vis the universities and higher education and knowledge, um, is global civil society an antidote to this? I mean, and, uh, I mean, think of this EU debate. I mean, to what extent was was going outside the nation state, in this case, Hungary, you know, helpful for CEU? I mean, I know ultimately it wasn't successful in preserving its position in Hungary. How, you know, how much can we can we use and rely on this something beyond the nation state to put pressure on nation states? Well, definitely, I, I think that, well, also throughout the history, and I think that's part of the memory cultures that we need to preserve is that the international solidarity is something that is always mm -hmm. useful and important in, in moments in which um, our freedoms uh, as humans and as researchers um, are um, endangered. In the case of CEU, I, I always like to underline one thing, and, and of course, the, the international mobilization was very strong. Uh, there was a lot of support. Um, unfortunately, at the end, it did not help. But there is an element beyond um, that I would like to say, and CU was lucky enough to be able mm. to move. We must not forget there are thousands of Hungarian academics, researchers, and students who still do live in Hungary are not able to mm. move. Uh, somewhere else and might not even always wish that as a solution. So I think that international solidarity has to be open for creating spaces of, of progress and fighting the, the repression in the places where repression is taking place, not only just uh, by further mobility or sometimes brain drain. Yeah, you can't keep escaping. You've got to deal with it where it is. Yeah. Uh, Hannah, uh, I'm... I you know, was brought up in the same Anglophone tradition as you. And, and so the academic freedom and, 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 gov and, and university governance issues are, you know, played out in Australia much the same way as they have here. Um, do you think we can sustain academic freedom in teaching and research and scholarship and our public role without taking a significant role in university governance? I mean, I think there's, there's differences about, you know, tactical differences people have about this. Some people argue that you've got to protect academic freedom ultimately by academics playing a leading role in governance. And others say that actually it's better if they're free of all of that because that compromises them and takes up their time. Uh, and it's better if they, you know, they can just get on with it. Yeah, I think um, I'd probably be quite pragmatic about that. Some people will and some people won't. Some academics are very bad at doing it. And management roles because that's not what we've been trained to do some are better um and that there isn't necessarily a a catch-all answer for that but the role the increasing role um of non-academic staff or many many more professional services staff to support more and more bureaucratic work that academics are still also doing seems like um part of this busy work which is actually taking away from academic endeavor let's say so the um some leadership roles can be taken without necessarily moving into management but there's nothing there's nothing wrong with um academics doing that I, I guess as a kind of more um I, there probably need to be several different fronts so working within the system working on the fringes of the system and so on and some of the, that means having friendly people in higher places as well. Yeah, I think we depend on that, don't we? We depend on ultimately on vice chancellors who understand and, and have commitment to the value system that which we are committed to. Um, let's bring in some uh, more contributions now. Now, um, I've just sent a message to Dimitri and Rasmus, and I'm going to ask you both to come in. 
Um, and so, so presenters, hold your responses until we've heard from both of these people. Dimitri, Dimitri Durobisky. Hello, Dimitri. Yeah, Dubrovsky. Uh, so Thank that's you. that's that's a very very uh, simple uh, question about that's that's my interest about the term uh, non-violent or verbal uh, extremism because I am working with it uh, in Russia and I I have uh, a lot of uh, examples of how the Russian government misused this term and my interest is who defined it where exactly it had been described and how exactly this definition influence the freedom of speech in the UK academia. Thank you. And, and Rasmus, uh, can you come in with your question? Hello, Rasmus Hasbo, are you there? This, this does happen sometimes. Sometimes people have trouble getting through. Rasmus, we'll give you a minute. Um, you can have another go perhaps in a minute if you don't come in now. Um, let me ask Nicholas to come in. Nicholas Jackson, are you there? Hello, Nicholas. You know, he can't because there's, there's a message saying he's in a workplace and cannot join at this time. No, I've just got that too. Thanks, thanks. Well, that's okay. So let's have a look at um, at Rasmus's question. I think presenters, and I think we can probably tackle it. Can you see it in the chat there? Yeah. Thank you for this fascinating presentation. My question is, considering the essential role of universities in nation building in the last 200 years, what are your reflections on your findings on academic freedom in relation to current trends on nation states taking back sovereignty from polities networks above them? So there's again about the relationship between the state and the university. Let me hand back to you, your, your responses to both. Should I go first this time? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, the first, question is kind of easier than Dimitri's question. Um, the, in the UK legislation on counter extremism comes not really, doesn't start with higher education. It's a broader government um, counter terror agenda from the early 2000s when they brought in these ideas about preventing violent extremism. Then it became non-violent extremism as well. The definition is fuzzy, but it's something around um, speaking against British values and then what are British values and um, the Home Office described them as um, belief in the rule of law and um, tolerance and respect for others um, or more I can't remember I might get thrown out um, but they're those kind of broad um, values which are not particularly um, unusual um, in Britain um, and they're I'm oh, sorry, they're not unusual to Britain. They're the kind of fundamental values that are also fundamental European values and so on, um, and very broadly interpreted. And they tend to, it tends to be used um, around um, extremism in the name of Islam, also in starting to be around, increasingly around far-right white supremacism as well. But the, the there have been cases in universities and there has been a specific duty on universities um, to look out for this. And some of the cases have been people researching extremism. Um, so a student who was um, disciplined for having and investigated by the police for having material on his computer that was part of his PhD work. So how academics can actually produce knowledge, produce critique is becoming more questionable under this very vague home office led, um, criminal justice led interpretation. I mean, as an aside, the current there's a current attempt to incorporate in an online safety bill. So not again, not about higher education specifically, um, it being illegal to communicate or portray online positive depictions of um, boats crossing the channel, migrant boats crossing the channel. What that means for people doing research with refugees and people and border crossers um, is then up to whether people choose to prosecute them. So there's a kind of risk that academics take that their academic freedom will be valued over these kind of ideas about security and broader laws. Um, I don't know that we can say much about Rasmus's question at this stage in our research, but it's an interesting one. Maybe Melissa has more to say on that. Yes, I, I think that actually that 
question is really interesting from the point of view, for example, when we were thinking about differences from the UK and France and, and this kind of taking back the sovereignty that, that Rasmus mentioned uh, was what's been happening in the context of Brexit and in the UK, the name of kind of giving back, making the UK great again, um, and, and that kind of strengthening the, the national identity and the, the idea of the importance of the state uh, within the UK. But I think that's exactly where it becomes interesting, because in the France, the same kind of tendencies were happening within the framework of this renewal of the European commitment, so to say. And then again, it has been called in the name of the so-called European values, European way of life, something that we have heard within the European Union uh, very um, often, actually, in the, in the last couple of years. Um, so, so, so there is definitely kind of a tension, as we know, the European Union never managed to be a, a strong enough political union in that sense. Um, but then regardless of that, and the fact that it does not have the direct kind of jurisdiction over the higher education and research, and this should be belonging to a more participatory process of the European higher education area, uh, what used to be Bologna process. Um, but, but we could see that, for example, in the last couple of years, also the issue of fundamental values has been introduced in the Bologna process. So there has been kind of a demand for this harmonization of the understanding what is the European way of life and seeing. So, 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 so this is kind of an important tension to understand that not necessarily nation building in terms of nationalism um, and, and these kind of narratives that Hannah and me discussed is always in direct contradiction with the transnational level of unities. Thank you both. Um, let me now bring in Ian McNay. I think you might be muted, Ian. You have to un unmute. I unmuted earlier on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, fine. Um, I, I, it, my, my message is it's nothing new. During the Thatcher regime, uh, I was an academic with the Open University, which was perhaps more susceptible um, to attempts to control because of its very visibility. We did have an investigation for, uh, through Keith Joseph that we were uh, operating courses with Marxist bias and were exonerated completely, but it did lead to internal imposition of controls um, to the extent that we couldn't write one unit with one view and another unit with another view. So it was a bit like you can't have a meeting unless somebody putting one view is uh, at least uh, able to be contra contradicted by another person putting the opposite view. But let me give you some examples, and I'm interested in my question, have other people had this experience of government interference? Um, perhaps because I work in education policy and management, I'm more susceptible to it. But three examples. We had a radio program, and in those days they went out at two o'clock in the morning, um, on the Education Reform Bill, the, what became the 1988 Education Reform Act, which was an interview with the Chief Education Officer in Cheshire which for those of you who don't know English local government is not a rabid left-wing uh, um, um, local authority. And he was critical of some points in the bill. And we arrived at nine o'clock the next morning in the office to find that the uh, Department of Education had rung up demanding a right of reply. And we had to explain to them that this was actually a classroom uh, event and they could get a right of participation by enrolling as a student. The second one was another uh, radio program, a discussion on um, the financing of education uh, in UK, where Rosemary Deem, whom some of you will know, was prevented from participating because she was a member of the Labour Party, as was I at that time. I left soon after, and I had imposed on me somebody from the Institute of Economic Affairs who demanded that he be allowed to speak without interruption or commentary and without editing in the post-program uh, process. And he was just, um, well, if you know the Institute of Economic Affairs, he was spouting right-wing untruths. And the final one, I did research on, uh, the. it was at the time of um, the Assisted Places Scheme to take people from state schools into public schools with support, um, to try and improve the A-level uh, scores. I looked into the improvement of A-level scores after this, 
and the statistics showed that they came mainly from the comprehensive schools. The department then stopped publishing those statistics and have never published them since. So you can't get access to compare the, where the improvement in student performance is coming from. So simple controls of that access and then the attempt directly to change the way that you're presenting programs and education policy. Will you not wish to be criticized? Which is again reminiscent then at a more extreme level of governments which make it treasonous if you comment critically on government policy. Are we heading that way? Well, thanks, Ian. Um, I'm going to uh, cut the speaking list a bit short because we're running out of time, but let me quickly bring in Janika Spanigal for, I think, the final question. Janika. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the framing of interference in terms of academic freedom. We've seen that interferences are often made in the name of academic freedom. Um, but I'm wondering, in the countries that you have studied, um, did you also see arguments that were explicitly made about academic freedom being outdated or otherwise problematic and should therefore be modified or abolished? Or is everyone essentially either pretending to protect academic freedom or just kind of staying silent on the consequences that that may have? Thank you. I'm going to go first, sorry, please, because I have to run and teach in two minutes. Um, but thank you for those questions. Yeah, I think, Yannicka, I would say, I mean, I know the UK best, Melissa is the kind of international expert, um, but the, I, I'm not aware of people necessarily saying academic freedom has gone far, too far, but it's part of this this obfuscation between academic freedom and freedom of speech. So the, there is critique of freedom of speech from some who would dare to say that around the limits to freedom of speech and not just the unlawful things that we're listing there but the kind of things like can someone just as Ian was talking about can someone just as a visiting speaker come and just say whatever they like without challenge um and when there are and often from student movements wanting to not have people that particular movements would find dangerous speaking on campus Obviously, there are different political positions on who that would be, but questions about where the limits of freedom of speech are. What this UK government has done is talk called that academic freedom, whereas academic freedom would be about having some kind of um, judgment by other acad the academic community about meeting some kind of standards to be able to um, claim, make claims to knowledge. Um, so really, some of that's a kind of mashup of the two which are slightly different and the in the European definition that Melita mentioned it's a bit clearer about what might be academic about academic freedom apart from just not losing your job um and on Ian's points yeah I don't think we're trying to say this is new but what is happening is there's a current global push on dangerous academic ideas which is also um happening in liberal democracies and, and we're particularly interested as it's our areas of scholarship in the national memory narratives. And of course, academia is part of building national identity has always been part of kind of legitimating some knowledges and not others. Um, but the way that's playing out around the current nationalism questions um, and clearly is intervening. I mean, I mentioned Gullis because it was my colleagues he was calling for to be sacked because of their academic work. Um, and so there's kind of, um, yeah, anyway, I'll stop talking. I have to go and teach. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry to run off. Um, Thanks, Hannah. That was great. Melika, do you want to add anything? I think this yes, will be the last. I will, I will be very, very brief, um, although I think Hannah uh, gave an excellent kind of roundup, but maybe just to, to go back to, to Yannicka's question. I, I think that it's really important to start from the question, what do we understand as academic freedom? And yes, for freedom of speech, um, I didn't come across uh, for demands um, on on kind of limiting it beyond the, the the general limitation in terms of international regulations and human rights. But what when we look into the academic freedom, I, I would say that there are also two additional phenomena taking place. One is, of course, the question of anti-intellectualism, and that is the question of the general kind of importance of academics and academic knowledge in the society today. And it has not been um, unusual to see, for example, the far 
um, right uh, discourses which go together with uh, anti-intellectualism and part of the attacks in, on the academics in the name of Islamo-Gauchism um, in France, for example, have been linked and, and kind of uh, created in that way. Second would be for me, uh, for example, the abolishment of tenure. I mean, in a certain way, now that we understand the importance of the economic conditions for academics and their academic freedom, the infringements on their economic and socioeconomic conditions in a certain way are calling uh, for the abolishment of academic freedom. And we know that there is an argument that uh, there shouldn't be a special privilege for the academics to have a job until the end of their lives because, well, um, then they could think too much and talk too much, and that's not what we would like them to do. Well, thanks very much, Mil Milika and and Hannah in her absence. And I thought that was one of the best webinars we've had. And uh, it will it, we didn't have enough people today, it, but it will repay continual reviewing on YouTube and 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 your substantive slide presentations. Uh, you know, hold that together. Um, they were really good. Um, I think we've we've been remiss in not calling out the freedom of speech argument in the UK as Orwellian. You know, I mean to. You know, to, to to suppress uh, decolonial discourse in the name of freedom of speech is absolutely incredible. And you know the the British blindness to to get to come to grips with the history and the colonial past is, you know, is is, is will always in the end prove to be self defeating. Um, that was yeah. I mean, there's a lot more to talk about. I'm thinking we think maybe we should mount a series uh, of webinars, four or six, around the topic of academic freedom in the uh, in 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 the spring and summer period in UK. Um, really grateful that you came on today, Malika, and that you, you know, contributed to the development of our thinking on this issue. And we look forward to having you on again, colleagues. Uh, our next um, webinar on Thursday is from Ji Yun Lee, uh, and she's going to ask the question: Is an international education ethical and political enough? I think we already know what the answer will be, and we look forward to hearing Ji Hoon then. Thanks to everyone for coming, and bye for now. Thank you very much, Simon. Goodbye.